Um, I want to introduce our uh, first keynote speaker. So Mike Amundsen, um, I would hope Mike does not need any uh, um, introduction, but I'll give him an int introduction anyway. So Mike has been kind of like a foundation stone of the API community with his many books that he's written about APIs and microservices. Uh, Mike runs conferences as well. He's one of the founders of RestFest. Um, he's a speaker, an author, a raconteur. Um, so Mike is kind of like, you know, the, the wise man of the API community, I like to think. So uh, Mike is here to, to talk, talk to us about um, speeding the future of APIs and how APIs will step up to the real-time online uh, demands of the future. Um, so I want you to uh, please welcome uh, Mike. Thank you. Hi, Saul. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right. Okay. Well, hello, everyone, to Happy Days Live. It's great to be here. Um, I wish I was physically there with you in Melbourne, but I'm coming to you live from my underground bunker in Kentucky where we're taking all the precautions necessary. But I just wanted to say it's great to see you, and I'm really happy to come talk to you today about this idea of speeding the future of APIs. And uh, typical for uh, the way I think about this, I want to talk to you about how oil pipelines, summer cottages, and the Internet of Things all combine to put us in this amazing space where we are today, where we can start to actually set the future of API space. Now, this is me. Uh, this is how you find me on GitHub and LinkedIn and Twitter and YouTube. And in fact, it's the only way you can find me now. I don't travel anywhere. I would love to connect with you, hear more from you, and hear about what you're working on today to help speed the future of APIs. A lot of material that I'll be talking about today is actually uh, captured in a book, a report I wrote for O'Reilly last year called API Traffic Management 101. It's really a, a collection of patterns on traffic management and monitoring and manipulating and shaping and how you can take advantage of that in your business. It's not just a technical book. It's more about what the future of APIs, the future especially of real-time APIs, mean for the way we architect, build, and manage and monitor. And that's actually what I want to jump right into. Uh, and this idea of performance really has become so paramount. When I talk to customers all across the globe, they're constantly telling me, they, they're worried about performance. They need more APIs, they need more calls, they need more services, but they're just concerned about the way this is gonna work. And users are demanding more and more timely services. The idea of requesting something and waiting, whether it's waiting a minute or a day, just seems out of bounds for a lot of users now. They want instantaneous, so performance is the imperative. And when you adopt this as your imperative, it means you have to rethink the idea of architecture uh, for all of your systems, the idea of how you monitor, how you know what's going on, and how you use information to manage. And this becomes really the secret weapon that organizations can take on. That is using the information you get from the way people use your APIs to manage for the future. Uh, but let's get a little bit ahead. Let's just talk about this performance imperative that's become so, so important. And I'm gonna break it down into just some simple things here about the transformation of your ecosystems, uh, API calls themselves just the technical aspect of what's going on, and the demands for response time that we talked about earlier. IDC, IDC did a report not too long ago that says 75% uh, of organizations think that they're gonna be transformed fundamentally in some way in the next few years. And that means digitally transfer, transforming. That means changing the role that APIs and services have inside the organization. A lot of organizations talk about becoming a digital enterprise or a digital organization. That's not the same as uh, becoming going online digitally, right? So being a digital organization, if you're manufacturing, that only goes so far, but there's lots to deal with, lots to, lots to focus on. And 90% of the organizations that say they're going through these transformations today say they're using microservices. Microservices means lots of things to lots of people, but what it means to everyone is smaller service and a higher call volume. It means you're gonna be doing lots and lots of network calls inside your organization and network calls outside your organization. And those network calls outside your organization are often to services you don't own, 
but you depend on, you have a dependency on them. This completely changes the way you're gonna think about safety, reliability, and architecture, and responsiveness. All of these things become super critical. And call volume is expected to increase as well. More than 70 people think it's gonna increase 50% or more. And that's a big deal. There's a lot of call volume involved out there. And at same, the organizations are saying things like they expect 250 million or more calls per month. That's eight to 10 million calls a day, every single day. And for large organizations, that's just gonna get bigger and bigger. And if you're an international organization, a finance organization, or anybody that stretches the globe, even you know goods and services, this is going to be huge. This is gonna affect a lot of us in a lot of ways. And finally, with all of those new API calls, with all of that volume, we also still see responsiveness. Uh, organizations say they're looking for something under 20 milliseconds. And that's really, really important. That's really, really fast. To be able to manage that across the globe is incredibly difficult. It's 25 milliseconds to travel around the world. So if you're talking 10 to 20 milliseconds, you need to start thinking about restaging your applications so they're closer to customers. We've been talking about doing this for decades. It's now becoming the imperative. So the organizations that focus on this transformation, that focus on, on, on uh, supporting the new volume and are ready to match that response time, they're the ones that are meeting that imperative. Now that's a super, super challenging thing. There's a lot that goes into that. Just buying hardware is not gonna do it. Switching your programming language is not gonna do it. Buying a new gateway is not going to do it. It demands a lot of change. It demands rethinking the problem. And in order to talk about that, I want to use a use case that where this happened, but I'm going to go back 20 years to 1997 and talk about oil pipelines. In the late 90s, um, oil pipelines were, this, were a huge, huge task. They were managed by control devices, uh, data acquisition devices, SCADAs, uh, and people would monitor them on a regular basis, basically polling systems. Uh, and you needed to set up large communication networks throughout the pipeline system, whether it's in Alaska or it's out in, in Doha or it's in the desert or somewhere else. And it became uh, really, really complex and expensive. Then suddenly there was a huge disruption. And that disruption was the breakup of AT&T and other telecommunications companies. Suddenly uh, they wanted a profit in this. They were no longer subsidized. Costs started to rise. The cost of arranging and setting up all these hardline systems or even, even major uh, satellite systems uh, became microwave systems, became really, really uh, uh, prohibitive. Round about this time, very small aperture uh, transmission satellites, VSATs, become really popular. In the late 90s is when we start to get satellite TV. We got that in the US anyway. So this, is, this converges. So this notion of having small satellites and this notion of having rising costs starts some people to thinking. And they start thinking about how can we take advantage of this space? How can we take advantage of this disruption? And one of the people who had been working in this pipeline space for almost two decades already wanted to invent a real-time control system that worked differently, that didn't work on the polling system that was really expensive, where you'd keep asking over and over even if data didn't change. Arlen Nippert, who's now uh, with CirrusLink, was thinking we have to make a major change. Arlen understood SCADAs and he understood information but he didn't understand communication. He ran into another person who had uh, been working at IBM on uh, message-oriented middleware in the 90s and knew a lot about communications and making them effective and efficient, didn't know much about SCADAs at the time. The two of them got together and they figured out how to establish a new protocol, a new set of patterns where they flipped the script. So instead of polling systems, they had systems calling them back, what we later called publish and subscribe. And what the two of them created was a new bandwidth efficient, lightweight, low battery, low storage system that would work via satellite links, but only work when they re were really necessary, would only call back when they had new information. So by 1999, this becomes known as MQTT. And if you think about the timing of this, this is in the, in the 90s. The, in the 90s is when HTTP is just starting to come into its own. These are parallel tracks solving very different problems, but parallel tracks. In fact, Nipper and uh, Stanford Clark completely uh, re-envisioned the pipeline industry and lots of other related industries, all because of their idea of changing the way things did. And what they did 
is they architected for performance. They thought differently about the way this was going to work. And when we think about architecting our organization, transforming our organization, it's a big deal. Lifting and shifting is not enough. You can't just copy your on-prem systems and put them in the cloud and expect them to work. You've got added distance, lots more connections. That's going to slow performance. Native storage and, and, and services operate under a completely different set of rules. You can't just have joins across the internet in, in SQL databases. It's a totally new deal. You're gonna to have to rethink services. You need to make them smaller, more lightweight, easier to produce, easier to install. You need to reduce the number of wait states by using asynchronous connections. You need to build in reversal and recovery so that if one breaks, there's some other one to take its place automatically. You have to have failover. And this means you're gonna to have to completely re-engineer data. You're gonna to have to do a lot of caching to stage in those locations. You're gonna to need to think about staging copies of the data maybe even streaming rights that may get resolved. This is where we get eventual consistency. Rethinking data is really important. And we rethink the idea of a network. We're no longer just working on our own network where the wires are owned by us. We're gonna to have to be working across the world. We're gonna be working with services that we've never seen before. We're gonna get a decrease in message size and increase in message volume. And that means we're gonna get some kind of RPC back as well. And that leads me to the second part of my story. And that is Summer Cottages on the Isle of Wight. So in 2008, the BBC did a story on somebody who had created, they called a computer whiz, who had created a Twitter house. And this house would tweet things like, the, you left the door open, you left the water running, the lights are on, uh, we caught a mouse in the mousetrap. All these things were happening on this Twitter house. And who was this computer whiz that had created this house that talked on the internet? Well, it was none other than Andy Stanford Clark, the gentleman who had created the messaging system with Arlen Nipper that saved the pipeline industry. Andy put his own house on Twitter. Why did he do this? Because he wanted to show people that this was possible. He wanted to show people it's more than just pipelines and transportation equipment. He, he used to say, like millions of people, this house uses the internet messaging service too. It's a way to connect to lots of things in lots of places. Andy completely rethought what he was doing. And by the way, he didn't put online how many devices there were or how often they connected or how fast they were. He put online the results of what those devices sensed or saw. Uh, windows are open, doors are ajar, lights have been left on, water is running. The actual activities, he figured out how to use these devices to monitor what was going around and the world around him. And that's the other big lesson in all this. We need to be monitoring for performance. We need to monitor in three key areas, infrastructure, businesses, and services all together. They all come through a central place, but they each of these organizations have different needs, different understanding of what's going on. The services need to know that they're up and running, that they're reliable, that they're doing their job as they're supposed to. They're taking care of data, whatever. Um, the infrastructure needs to know that they can meet, reach things, they can communicate things, that they're not degrading in some way. They need to actually be able to fix things if things go bad. But more importantly, the business needs to know if we're actually doing business. Are we selling widgets? Are we meeting customer demands? Are we closing sales? This is the most important element. One of the things we learn from this online real-time API system is now we've got online real-time data about our business itself, not just about our equipment, not just about our developers, not just about the services, but the actual business of transactions that we're making. So sure, infrastructure needs to focus on machines and connections and all those other uh, nasty little bits. Services need to focus on microservices, internet service buses, they need to focus on latency and error rates and limits in for each one of those services to make sure they stay healthy. But as we talked about before, users need to focus on transactions, business transactions, completed orders, all these things that are super important. It's important for us to understand that the real benefit here is not just that we're doing things faster, but we get more information about our everyday business. And that leads us to the, today's Internet of Things, where they're everywhere. They're on vehicles, they're in buildings, they're on boats and ships and planes and all these other kinds of things. There are all sorts of messaging standards by now, lots of proprietary ones as well as shared ones. MQTT still ranks at the very top in these Internet of Things message standards. 
It's important to note that HTTP is also still very popular in the Internet of Things space, especially with HTTP 2.0, where we've got binary messaging and several other things. There's actually a lot of value still in HTTP, but there's lots in this space. And you're going to have to figure out how to navigate this zone, whether it's AMQP, WebSockets, or whatever. Like Andy says, um, we're moving towards an Internet of Things where thousands, millions, and trillions of devices will be connected. And they'll be telling us about one little piece of data for each of them. And we need to be prepared for that kind of scale. We're used to building large-scale systems that tell us lots of things about one, one in ecosystem. Now we're going to build lots and lots of small things that make up an ecosystem, a view onto the world. That's a very different kind of architecture that we have to plan for. What I love, uh, one of the things that Andy says is, by mining the sea of data, we can make information and knowledge about the world that we're in. We're creating the information. We're creating the knowledge. This is a huge responsibility. What we collect, what we capture, what we share, that becomes the information that becomes important for everyone. It's important that we share the right information. It's important that we share equality information, fair information, balanced information. There's a lot of responsibility in this notion of the Internet of Things that we've got in front of us. And what we learn, especially from this Internet of Things today, is you're now managing your business. You're managing for performance. You're managing for the future. And there are three areas that I want to focus on that the speeding up APIs can give us. And that is insight uh, to what we're doing, what's happening every day, solving the problems as they come up, automatically solving problems, and more important, anticipating needs. So this insights, problem solving, and anticipation becomes really critical to the way speeding up our APIs can help us. We're going to be monitoring what's going on. That means we can manage access. We can scale services. We can diagnose errors. We can even uh, recover from failures and uh, even experiment with things in the future. So monitoring traffic and monitoring builds is very important as well. There are internal workings of every organization. We need lots and lots of dashboards for this. If anybody has learned anything from our current pandemic situation, it's that dashboards tell us the state of affairs of any particular moment. I see dashboards everywhere all the time. That's going to be the same going forward. We can use all of this uh, tracking information, all this live information, to make security watches. We can start to be preemptive about security. We don't have to always lock uh, everything until we wait for permissions. We can actually stop people before they even act. We can scale services. We know when we need more services, less services. We're really managing traffic. It turns out there's a lot more activity in the Pacific Rim. We're going to actually fire up more servers in the Pacific Rim than we normally have in the Atlantic side. That's how we manage traffic. We're going to start routing people uh, to uh, the Australian servers because there's not as much traffic there right now. We can manage traffic and we can diagnose errors. There are lots and lots of problems in California servers. Let's go find out what the problem is and diagnose those errors ahead of time. Finally, we can use this information along with things like machine learning and, and AI to start thinking about automating recovery. If machines aren't performing well, take them out, put new machines in. We know the rules. We know how this works. Don't just tell somebody a machine's not performing well. Do the work. We can also run experiments. We can run small experiments to see if this improves things. This whole idea of chaos engineering and site reliability engineering comes from this space of running experiments using lots and lots of data. So let me take a little sip here. And let's wrap this up. So we talked about this notion of performance being so important. We're all challenged. We're all disrupted. Now is the time to start thinking about re-architecting and thinking completely differently about what we build, how we monitor it, and how we manage it. So we need to prepare for call volumes to go up and for transaction, uh, transaction time to actually go down. We need to redesign our services, re-engineer data, rethink networks. This is a whole new way of thinking about it. Think of what Nipper did after 20 years of working in polling systems. He completely flipped the script and upside down and adopted a whole new way of thinking about solving his, his uh, problems. We need to be monitoring infrastructure and services, but we also need to be monitoring our business. Real-time APIs are going to help us do that. And then finally, we need to adopt this manage, resolve, and anticipate 
system of thinking about it. This becomes a sort of a maturity model. It's one thing to make sure that we're up and running. It's another thing to be able to know ahead of time if things are going bad. It's another thing to be able to fix them before humans even know about it. That's what speeding up the future of APIs is really all about. So I'm gonna end this on a note from a friend of mine, uh, uh, Warren Bennis, um, who has done just amazing things for leadership in business. And I love this line, in life change is inevitable, but in business, change is vital. And I would argue with the kind of world we're living in today, change is just as inevitable and just as challenging. And that's the imperative that we need to focus on. So hopefully this has been interesting to you. If you wanna dig deeper into this subject, I'll share these slides. You can visit this URL and download a free copy of the uh, report, uh, API Traffic Management 101. And uh, with that, I'm gonna close. I thank you very much. Hopefully this has been interesting and maybe exciting and gonna give you some ideas and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. So thank you, thank you very much. There you go, Saul. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, that was a great talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience at all? And I, so if you wanna ask any questions, just put them into the um, stage chat. Um, so Mike, I was, I'm kind of surprised that MQTT was uh, such an old protocol. I didn't realize it reached yeah. back into the 90s there. So yeah, it's, why do you think yeah. HTTP took off and MQTT not so much? Right. Um, well, I, I don't really know. I think when you when you listen to interviews from uh, Stanford Clark and Nipper early on, they were so focused on solving their their oil pipeline problem that was that was the only people that really adopted it in the early going. I think the other thing is they didn't really have a successful standardization of MQTT uh, until after um, uh, Stanford Clark did his little house bit. He kind of, that was almost like a show, like a performance art piece, right? And then suddenly in 2008, people realized, hey, this is really valuable. Um, there had been some competitors, Zigbee, of course, and others had been around that same time as well. So I, I think it, they sort of solved their original problem and then sort of left it at that. They kept them quite busy. I mean, the oil industry is huge and all the related industries, shipping and so on and so forth. So I, what you're right, it wasn't really until after 2010 that MQTT became sort of well-known outside that sphere. And then it's really kind of ballooned. It's grown a whole world around it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually involved, probably prior to 2010, involved in a, a utilities, a distribu electricity distribution project where yeah. we actually replaced SCADA with HTTP. Yeah. And it was to get, you know, SCADA was big and expensive and good for the transmission lines. But right. when we went down to the distribution lines where things had to be mass volume, cheap and cheerful, yeah. we yeah. <laughs> put in these devices which use HTTP. And that worked quite well. But it was very much that polling, are you there yet, yep. are you there yet, are you there yet yep. type profile. Um, yeah. And HTTP, I think, would have been much better. Yeah, Yeah, and that's when uh, it was that, that polling system and that sort of heavy-duty SCADA world that Nipper wanted to overcome, needed to overcome because the satellites were so expensive, right? So that's when they got this idea that we'll stop polling, we'll just start publishing. And also I think there was, a, there was some other sort of serendipity. Somebody, I forget who it was, somebody created a, a SCADA device that understood TCP IP back there in like 97, 98 or something like that. So those hadn't been around for a while. All those were all sort of proprietary, mostly tel telephonic, uh, uh, transactions. So that was another thing that sort of helped this along. So things just had to sort of align in a certain way in order to make it work. Yeah, great. Okay, we do have, uh, we've got a question from Anka um, in the chat. He uh, says, how yeah. important a role does chaos engineering or SRE in general play in the future of managing APIs? Yeah, so so I'm just gonna give a sort of a general opinion. I don't work a lot in the chaos and SRE space. I've done a lot of reading on it. I would recommend, uh, Casey Rosenthal has a great book uh, that he did. Um, uh, I think it's with O'Reilly about this, but I will say everything that I've seen when I start talking to people um, with this flood of data that we have makes this idea of site reliability engineering, 
and then experiments. That's really what chaos engineering is really about, is experimenting much more stable, much more reliable, and much more possible. I think it's going to be huge. I think what's going to happen is we're going to find more and more things happening in site reliability engineering that lead to automation, that automatically start fixing things, that automatically understand patterns. Now, we're, I mean, we're years off, but I think that's where things are going to go. So I think understanding the role of site reliability engineering today, how it affects, <coughs> excuse me, how it affects the way you engineer and implement, and the possibilities of these experiments, that's what the chaos space is about, shunting a little traffic off, trying something out, experimenting with your ideas. I think these are going to be super critical roles. I think my, my advice today would be, if you're just getting into the space, I would really focus on these areas. It's going to be huge. And it's real. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's math heavy. It's engineering. But there's a lot of fantastic opportunity in that space. I think it's important. Mm, yeah, I agree. And I, I also think it's really interesting that the people who are applying chaos engineering now are organizations who've gotten so large in terms of their microservice infrastructure that it's impossible to do test in a yep. test environment, right? You have to test in the real world because yep. they, they, they really are pushing the envelope. Um, yeah. We've got a, another question. Isn't request response API still poly? String-based event-driven architectures seem to be more aligned to the use cases you've covered. Yeah, so definitely stream-based is, is much more aligned. And MQTT is not a polling system, right? So MQTT allows me to, uh, to publish events uh, and send them to a broker, and then that broker can listen to subscriptions and pass them out. So, so uh, it's definitely uh, HTTP is still some kind of request response, and you can set up timing pollings but it's not going to be the same as something like MQTT or AMQP or WebSockets or, or some of these other things. So there's definitely a big difference. And um, I, while I think this uh, real-time has a place, there's a distance at which real-time or this, this publishing um, changes, changes dynamics. Um, I had a, a very brief experience with some space data systems engineering uh, CSSDS is the name of the organization. It's a worldwide organization for computer systems in space. Think about when you're millions of miles away. Think about the minutes, the hours, the possible days it takes for a message to get to somewhere. You can't do any kind of polling of any kind in that. It all has to be this notion of publish and subscribe. Tell me when something happens. Um, mm -hmm. But it changes the dynamics uh, immensely. So streaming ideas is very important, but not just for the short uh, response times either. When we start thinking about super long response times, it's going to be very, very important as well. Yeah, I, I must admit, I often talk about an API as being an interface. And whether it's a, a request response interface or it's a streaming interface or you know a query interface, I'll use the word API because I'm lazy. And most people know what I mean. Um, I'm not going to apologize for it because I think the the what the, what did we used to call it the um, the I've forgotten the the word now but the the way that we interact with the API and the underlying mm -hmm. transport that we use is less yep. important than the contract that you put in place to say this is how it should be used. So therefore, yeah, and, yeah. request for streaming, you know, it's, it's kind of a secondary or, or that's and an implementation issue, I guess. It is. And I'm seeing more people mix RESTful and what I've been starting to call eventful. I did a did an article from Muralsoft not too long ago, and we start talking about this notion of eventful systems, right? So whether it's uh, message notification alerts, or whether it's uh, streaming data or event carried notice uh, bodies, or even just CQRS, uh, you know, uh, rearrangements. There are all sorts of versions of this. And when you think about GraphQL and you think about SOAP and you think about uh, HTTP REST APIs and you think about MQTT or other stream direct streaming stuff, these are all variations on, like you say, that transport layer. And it's really important for us to start thinking about designs that separate the implementation details as much as possible. Now, sometimes you can't. There are certain things I can do 
in a streaming system that I can't do in request and response. But uh, thinking about those as separate elements is going to be super important. So I think you're right on about that. OK. We've got a couple more questions. So speaking of SOAP, uh, one of the questions is, uh, can you explain in more detail why you are focusing on REST other than, say, SOAP? Question mark. Maybe maybe there's a book sale in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, there's, there's, there's lots of reasons for this space. I started out um, very, very similar you know, in the same space that as Stanford Clark was, although not at his level. He owes, he's got like 20 patents. He's a distinguished IBM fellow. I'm not. But this idea of message-oriented middleware uh, really struck me as, as really, really interesting. I f ended up focusing in the HTTP space uh, in the REST, so-called REST space, because I thought there was just so much opportunity uh, for possibility. And I think there still is a great deal of opportunity there as well. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, I, th I think it's important to realize a lot of the, uh, as, as sort of Saul mentioned, I think a lot of the architectural underpinnings, a lot of the basic elements uh, are going to be at play, whether you're, whether you're working on like an object, you know, shared object system like uh, the SOAP system or RPC, like gRPC, where you're just talking about remote method invocations. Or whether you're talking about GraphQL, which is you know data services, they all have their place and they all have their power. Uh, I can't keep track with all of them. I can't keep up with all of them. So I continue to focus on that REST space because that's the one that I've I've come to know really well. But there's lots and lots of opportunity out there, and I have a lot of customers that are not moving away from SOAP. Uh, they've got a lot of intellectual property investment. They're doing just fine, and there's no reason to change them just to be dare rigueur, just because it's a new thing. They, they love what they're doing. Mm, yes, uh, I agree. I mean, it's, it's horses for courses. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of talks this year in our conference around event-driven architecture. Um, so the next question kind of anticipates that. Um, so what's the main difference between API-driven and event-driven and when to use? Any example use cases for both? Well, I can tell you one of the things I've been working on the last several months is trying to come up with sort of a, a an abstract language for interfaces that is not an IDL, it's not a definition language, but a description that you then turn into a definition language. And one of the things I've been working on is using the same general description to generate a uh, an open API document, which is very HTTP resty, and an async API document. In my case, I've been using it for MQTT. Uh, well, it turns out there are lots of frictions there. And I think one of the things that I've grown to understand is I've sort of adopted a sort of an HTTP hat, what we would call web API hat. Like this, I put this hat on and I immediately know, oh, I need a list and a, and a read and a write and a delete and a filter and maybe some other, other extra actions kind of deal. And I just sort of know where that goes. I've got that sort of wired into my brain. But in an event-driven system, I don't just think, so all the things I described was, was on the server side, the producer side. In an event-driven system, I really have to think a lot about the consumer side. So what are they going to want to know about? They're going to want to know when somebody logs in. They're going to want to know when someone's changed a record. They're going to want to know when someone's abandoned a cart. They're going to want to know when someone's completed a purchase. These are a completely different set of things that go on. And that's why in my talk, I talked a lot about this idea of moving beyond the technical and into the business realm. So as I work with people more and more who want to create information systems about what's going on in their business every day, not just their technology, I find this event thing to be event, a sort of an event-driven pattern to be a much more applicable, much more directly usable uh, uh, way to go. And that's really what's been driving a lot of the customers I've been working with for the last year or so. Mm, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I like to think about, um, if we think about the state model of a resource, so whether it's a door or a switch or a customer or a transmission line, it's got a state model, right? And you use the APIs to drive the state, to change the state, and you listen to events as a notification of that state change. And if you design with that in mind, then you get a nice um, mixture of APIs and events that complement each other. Um, yeah. So that that seems to be that seems to work well. That that's a that's a really really good point. So that that's like that's the next level up, right? You talked about the actual state of the system, 
And then you talked about whether or not we'll use this kind of implementation or that kind of implementation. That's a brilliant way to really to think about it. Uh, and that's when you start to have this notion that, you know, there are lots, there are lots of fish in the sea. There are lots of opportunities here. Let's find the one that fits best for this particular moment. And that's, a, that's really a great way to think about it. So. Okay. All right. Um, how are we doing for time? I think, um, I think there's no more questions there. So is there anything you want to just um, mention as closing? Um, what's your latest book that you're working on? <laughs> well, I will say, since you gave me the opportunity, um, yeah. I'm just finishing, we just finished the final edits on a book called Design and Build Great Web APIs. And it's definitely in the HTTP web API space, but it starts from the idea of API first and works through modeling and designing and describing and documenting and prototyping and sketching and building and deploying and securing and testing and releasing and then going back and doing it all over again. So it's this sort of whole cycle of work. So it's a book that I just finished with Pragmatic and I'm very excited to be able to do it. I've been working on it for quite a while. Uh, it sort of collects up things I've learned from so many people over the, the last decade or so. So, so that's definitely going to be around. Uh, I will continue to talk about this eventing as well. Um, I'm working on a couple other projects uh, that are sort of in the hush, and that really will be around this notice of, of eventful versus restful and how we can start to combine the two of them. So I'm, I'm actually managing to keep myself very busy, even though I'm not traveling, maybe because I'm not traveling anymore. <laughs> and it's been an amazing uh, several months, and I hope to keep at it. Mm, that's great. I like the word eventful. I'm going to start using that. I hope you've got it. Have you got a trademark? Have you got the domain name? I, I don't have a trademark. <laughs> let's, let's see if we can see if we can give it legs. I don't know if it's like hashtag it or something like that. It may be a tough one, but let's let's give it a go. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks a lot for joining us, Mike. Um, you bet. We, for everybody else, we're going to go to a break now, a 30 minute break. Please um, wander around, talk to people visit our um, exhibition space, talk to our sponsors, um, and then we're coming back at uh, 10.20 on the dot, be in there at 10.20. Um, the three streams are open, strategy, execution, platforms, check your online programs. We've also got the Slack workshop starting immediately after the break and um, a couple of other round tables and workshops in there as well. So please check the, um, the online schedule. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Um, okay. Enjoyed the talk and we'll see I'll you see on the break. Thank you. Bye-bye.